He has a unique story, he's a unique guy, and he wants to share it with you today. So with me, will you please welcome Rohan Murphy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. How you guys doing today? Uh, it's early, huh? How you guys doing today? There we go, much better, much better. Thank you so much for having me. Once again, my name is Rohan Murphy. I am a youth motivational speaker from Long Island, New York, and today I'm here with you all to share my story and tell you how I overcame not having legs. But with that said, I'm going to start from the very beginning. And unfortunately for me, I was born with a very severe birth defect that left both my legs deformed. And a lot of kids always ask me, well, what do you mean deformed? So to give you all a better understanding, I want all of you to take your hands and grab your kneecaps. Simple enough. Well, when I was born, my kneecaps were on the opposite side. When I was born, my legs were backwards. That's how bad the form my legs were. At the time, unfortunately, my doctors didn't really have any answers for my parents. And my parents took it really hard, especially my mom, because she blamed herself. She thought maybe she had done something or had taken something during her pregnancy to really cause this deformity. But it wasn't her fault. I guess you could say it was just mother nature dealing me a bad hand in the game of life. Went on to live life those first couple years with the formed legs, and then finally, finally, at the age of four, my parents and doctors decided that it'd be best if I had my legs amputated in hopes of someday, maybe around middle school or high school, and get prosthetic legs and walker prosthetics. So at the age of four, I had my legs amputated, but I had some complications through surgery, and now required five distal surgeries afterwards. So as a kid, spent a lot of time in the hospital, a lot of time at home trying to recover from these different surgeries and procedures. And for the first couple of years, I was even homeschooled. But then finally in third grade, like any other kid, I started to attend school. And that first day of school in third grade, <laughs> that's when it hit me. That's when I truly realized that I was different. Because when I first started going to school, there were so many things I couldn't do on a daily basis that all my friends and classmates were able to do. And a big thing for me at that point in my life, when I was a kid, was the ability to play sports. Because as a kid, I loved sports. I had a real natural passion for sports. I think that love and passion for sports came from my father, Noel, because he was from Jamaica, and he named me at this rate athlete when he was a kid. The first one was a cricket player by the name of Rohan Kanai, and my middle name, Mario, came from his favorite soccer player, Mario Kempes. And that's how I got my full name, Rohan Mario Murphy. Has a nice little ring to it, right? <laughs> All right, fine, it doesn't. <laughs> But anyhow, growing up without legs, I still love sports. But when you don't have legs, you really can't play too many sports, like travel, soccer, little league baseball. And at a young age, I never really thought that I would have the opportunity to play competitive, able-bodied sports. But thankfully, that all changed when I was in middle school, when I was in eighth grade, because of one person, because of one teacher, my eighth grade phys ed teacher, Mr. Ron Croto, a coach, as I called him. And you see, most kids in schools don't really know or believe that the teachers and administrators in their schools have that ability and that power to change their lives for the better. But trust me, believe me, they do. And that's exactly what Coach did for me. See, Coach realized, once again, by not having legs, obviously, I couldn't play most sports now, like soccer, which he was coach of at a middle school. So Coach was nice enough and kind enough to make me a team manager for a middle school soccer team. And by becoming a manager for the middle school soccer team, I would go to practice every day, go to all the games, help them take stats and attendance. And finally, for the first time in my life, I was a part of a sports team. And I did such a good job being a manager for the soccer team during the fall, the very next season, during the winter, coach once again it gave me that same role as manager, but this time for our school's wrestling team. So I did a pretty good job once again being his manager during the wrestling season, during the winter, helping him out with the team. But then one day, towards the end of the season, coach came up to me for his ed class. And I'll never forget that day. He has this smile on his face, he comes running up to me, he looks at me, and he tells me, Ro, 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 I got a great idea. I asked him, coach, what's that? He says, Ro, I've been doing some thinking, and I think, I think you could wrestle. I think you could somehow go out on that mat and wrestle kids with legs and be a wrestler like anyone else. And I asked him, right, coach, but if I don't have legs, 
how in the world could I wrestle? He said, it'll be easy. He said, I was have to somehow wheel myself out onto the mat, jump on the mat, grab kids' legs, and take them down. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. And I told him, you know, coach, huh, thanks, but no thanks. But I told coach, wrestling just wasn't for me. I told coach, I was, I was just happy being a manager. But the thing about coach, what really made him great, and what really made him special, not only as a teacher, not only as a teacher, but as a person, coach did not give up on me. He did not give up on me. He was so persistent. Every single day, he would just come up to me in the hallway in school. He would try to get me to join the wrestling team, try out the sport. Usually, I'll tell coach no. But one day at the school, coach finally got a hold of me, literally. He brought me down to the practice room, and he started really demonstrating to me how I could wrestle without legs, how I could take people down, how I could pin people, and I couldn't believe it. Finally, I found a sport that I can do. I found a sport that I can play. I told him, all right, coach, you know what? Next year, when I'm in high school in ninth grade, I'm going to somehow, I'm going to try for a high school wrestling team and I'm gonna somehow make the team just for you, coach. He said, all right. So of course now, I had to go home and I had to talk to my parents about it. But my mom did not want me to wrestle. You guys know how moms are. <laughs> my mom was so worried about me getting hurt, getting injured. And she even told me, or said to me, Ro, you're gonna be out there wrestling kids with legs. You're gonna be at a huge disadvantage. Aren't you worried? Aren't you afraid that you're gonna lose a lot? I told her, no. I told him, no, I was not afraid to fail. I was not afraid to fail. I was wanted to try. And if it didn't work out, then so be it. At least, at the end of the day, I can say, I tried my best. My parents finally said, all right, bro, go ahead and do it. So ninth grade year came, I did just that. Tried for high school wrestling team. And that first practice in ninth grade, it was huge. It was probably the most important day of my life because if I was gonna really gonna be able to compete in the sport of wrestling, <laughs> I couldn't wear those fake legs. I couldn't wear those fake artificial legs that I wore every single day when I was younger. Whenever I would go somewhere in public, whether it be the mall, the movies, and especially school. Now, why did I wear those prosthetic legs? Well, I wore those prosthetic legs because still, at that point in my life, when I was younger, I was still so insecure about myself. I was so embarrassed, so ashamed about being different, so ashamed about not ha having legs, so ashamed about being disabled. And I finally said to myself, you know what, Ro? I have to be who I am. I have to live my life to the fullest. I have to be Rohan Murphy. And hopefully, hopefully, all the kids in my school, and especially all my new teammates in the wrestling team, will be kind enough to embrace me for who I am. So I went inside first practice anyhow. I took off my prosthetic legs, hopped on my wheelchair, crawled out the middle of the mat. I sat down, and I was looking at all my new teammates around me. And I really and truly thought someone was going to make fun of me. I thought maybe someone was even gonna bully me just because I was so different. But something that practice happened, which amazed me, that I'll never forget. Something amazing happened. All my new teammates, all my new teammates, every single one of them came up to me, one by one. They shook my hand, they looked me in the eyes, and they told me things like, bro, it's great to have a wrestling team. We're gonna have a great season. And for the very first time in my life, for the very first time in my life, I saw my own family, I felt acceptance. And I felt that belonged somewhere. And I'm telling you this because what I think we should teach all young people, I think we should, we should teach all young people to be inclusive, not exclusive in life. Teach them to be inclusive, not exclusive in life. And for me personally, speaking at middle high schools all across the country, being inclusive, that's not an anti-bullying stance. Speaking to adults like yourselves, that's not a liberal stance. To me, being inclusive in life, that's a human stance. So once again, as our young people grow older, <laughs> so once again, as our young people grow older, let's, let's teach them. Let's teach them to be inclusive, not exclusive in life. But anyhow, back to wrestling. Went on to wrestle my first year in ninth grade. I couldn't believe it. I was so happy to, to finally be able to play a sport. I was so appreciative. I felt so blessed to finally be able to play a sport. But with that said, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. My first season wrestling, I didn't do too well. I finished that first season on JV, junior varsity, with a record of only two and 13. Two and 13, what does that mean? 
All right, easy, easy, right. Two wins and 13 losses, not very good. But after the season, I started to really think to myself, what if I could somehow overcome this? What if I could somehow, despite I'm not having legs, could really become successful? And not only wrestling, not only wrestling, but big picture here, what if I could become successful in school and life as well? Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be remarkable? Wouldn't that be extraordinary? So after that first year in ninth grade, I started to work really hard at sport. I did everything in my power and ability to become a better wrestler. Came back in 10th grade, improved a lot, made a varsity team. And I finished that season on varsity with a record of 25 and six. Big difference, I'm two and 13. But still, after the season, I wasn't really happy. I was proud of myself. I was proud of myself, but I wasn't satisfied. You see, for me, good just was never good enough. I didn't want to be just good. I wanted to be better than that. I wanted more to life. I did not want to be just good. I wanted to be great. After the season, I went to our team awards dinner, and my coach, he gave me the team award for most improved wrestler. I remember sitting there holding that big award, that big trophy, and my mom was sitting right next to me. And she asked me, Ro, what's wrong? Why aren't you happy? Why aren't you smiling? I told her that I don't want this award for most improved wrestler. I don't want this award. I want the other one. The one for MVP. I want the award that said best wrestler. So after that dinner, I had a little meeting with my coach, and I asked coach, how could I somehow get to the next level in sport of wrestling? How could I somehow go from good to great? He said to me, Ro, this summer, why don't you try going to a wrestling camp? Maybe even two camps, maybe even three. I told him, all right. So I went home with my parents, anyhow, and we did some research on camps from all across the country online. And most of the camps that we found kind of seemed the same to me. Three-day camp here, four-day camp there. Nothing really stuck out to me. And then I finally found this one camp that was pretty unique, that was pretty special. It was called the Jay Robinson 28-Day Intensive Wrestling Camp, which was held all the way out at the University of Minnesota. Did some research on the camp, found out that all the wrestlers would go there, wake up every single morning bright and early at 6 a.m., work out for four to five times a day for 28 days straight. I told my parents, oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I need. Not only for wrestling now, but for life as well, because it was around its age. I was beginning to really look at colleges. And growing up, when I was younger, ever since I was a little kid, I had two goals for myself. I had two goals that I really wanted to accomplish in life. One was to find a sport that I can play, even without legs, which I found in wrestling. But the second goal was, after high school, I wanted to attend a big university. I wanted to live on a big college campus independently by myself, and someday earn a degree and graduate from that school. And for me, that was a big deal because, don't get me wrong, now growing up, I was very lucky, very fortunate to have a great family, great parents, but my parents, especially my mom, were very, very, very overprotective, right? <laughs> Let me give you an example of that. So when I was younger, in middle school or high school, and any time my class or school would go on a field trip to say the Empire State Building, Washington, D.C., Frost Valley, my parents, or well, my mom, would never allow me to go because she was so afraid that something bad might happen to me. So I finally just got the point in my life, and I told my mom that, just time to let me go. It's time to set me free. I had to figure out if I could be independent. I had to figure out if I could someday live on a college campus by myself and take care of myself like any other college student. So thankfully, my parents agreed anyhow, and they allowed me to go to this camp in Minnesota, and this camp has changed my life. It really gave me a different perspective on things, like how much hard work, dedication, and sacrifice was going to take me great. And not only wrestling, but anything else in life as well. And some of those workouts at camp that we had to do, some of those practices, or drills at camp, as they call them, they were pretty tough. They were pretty challenging. Let me give you an example one. So at camp, like I said, we wake up every single morning, bright and early, 6 a.m., and usually, we would just have a running practice. And most of the time, I would just do laps around the track by myself in my wheelchair. But this one morning, my camp counselor really wanted me to push myself. He really wanted to challenge me. My camp counselor happened to be a guy by the name of Brock Lesnar. Guys ever heard of Brock Lesnar? Anyone? Pretty famous UFC fighter, WWE wrestler as well. So one morning, Coach Lesnar brought me down inside the middle of the track who does a football field. He brought me down to one end zone. He said, Ro, hop out of your wheelchair, which I did for him. He then looks at me and he tells me, all right, Ro, 
I want you to somehow, for me, walk down to that end zone in the handstand, 100 yards, all the way down. Once you get down to that first end zone, how about you then do a pyramid of 10 push-ups? Do a pyramid of 10 push-ups. Then after all that row, try walking back down another 100 yards, back down to the first end zone. And initially, I thought Coach was kidding. I thought he was joking, but he wasn't. And now I was at a point in my life when I would just do anything to improve. I would do anything to make myself not only a better wrestler, but a better person as well. So I did it for Coach, 100 yards, just like this. All the way down. And I finally made it halfway to the 50-yard line, and Coach Lesnar surprised me. Coach Lesnar told me, you know what, bro? I know this workout is tough, I know it's difficult. How about you stop and go back? He told me I did not, I did not have to finish the workout because it was so difficult. But I told Coach no because I'm the type of person that when I start something, I'm gonna. So 100 yards, just like this, all the way down. Finally made down to that first end zone, and now Coach Lesnar tell me, all right, bro, try doing that pyramid of 10 push-ups. And that's pretty tough in itself, right? Because a pyramid of 10 push-ups isn't just one, two, three. It goes something like this. One, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Yeah. All the way up to 10. Yeah, I'm not going to do all 10 now, right? <laughs> Thanks, appreciate that. But then finally, after all those push-ups, another 100 yards, back down to the first end zone for Coach Lesnar. And I always tell young people this story because growing up, when I was their age, as a kid, my family and I were around a lot of different doctors, physical therapists, that always told me what I couldn't do in life. They always told me what I couldn't accomplish in life without legs. So, growing up as a kid, whenever somebody told me I can accomplish something. I did it anyway, just to prove them wrong and prove to them that I could be successful with or without legs. Like I said, growing up, I had two goals for myself. I had two goals, play a sport, and then somebody at the high school graduate from a big university, big college. One day back in high school, in 11th grade, I had a meeting with my guidance counselor, I'll never forget. We were in his office discussing life at the high school, going over colleges, universities, and I told him my first choice, my dream school, was Penn State University. Penn State, a school that was great academically, great school academically, but a school with also one of the best, if not the best, Division I wrestling programs. I told him I wanted somebody to go to Penn State. I told him I wanted somebody to wrestle for Penn State. But most importantly, I told him I want to someday graduate from Penn State University. You know what he told me? He said to me, Roe, Penn State, that's a great school. I know you got the grades for it, but I don't know what's, I don't know what's right for you, Roe. That's a huge campus, he said. 40,000 students on one college campus. He said to me, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be too much for me? He also told me that it snows there a lot in the winter. And believe me, it does. <laughs> he said to me, well, Roe, if it snows, how would you be able to get around campus or get to class on your own? And I never forgot that. I never, ever forgot that. And as you all know, to make a long story short, yeah, I went to Penn State. I graduated from Penn State University. <laughs> and just in case any of you are wondering how I was able to get around campus, I got to class my own when it snowed. Simple. I would call camp security, have them pick me up and take me to class. <laughs> Easy does it. And back to that camp anyhow, I think I impressed Coach Lesnar by doing a workout across the football field. Why? Because he made me do it again. Great guy, huh? <laughs> and the very last day of camp, the very last day of camp, the 28th day, before each wrestler got to go home, each wrestler had to run a marathon. Simple. You run a marathon, then you leave, you go home. But the thing about the marathon that really made it different was that for the very first time at camp, for the very first time I camp, I guess the only time I camp, each wrestler was given a choice. Each wrestler was given a choice to run either five, 10, or even 15 miles. Take a wild guess at how many miles I did in that wheelchair. 
Well, it was actually 16 or 17 because I got lost on the way home. <laughs> but the point is, just like all those wrestlers at that camp, every young person has a choice in their own lives. Every young person has a choice to be either average, good, or great at whatever they love to do. Whether it's a favorite subject in school, favorite sport, art, dance, music, we all have a choice to be either average, good, or great. I hope, I hope you push your young people to be great. I hope you want them to get the most out of life. I hope you always want them to be their personal best. Because as you all know, <laughs> you ain't living twice. You get one life. You get one life. So you might as well make a count with or without legs. I came after my camp anyhow. I did pre-ball in high school wrestling in New York. And like I said, at the high school, I attended Penn State University. So while I was at Penn State, I decided to go out for the Penn State wrestling team. So one day, I had a meeting with the Penn State wrestling coach in his office. I went up to his office. I knocked on the door. Coach answered. At the time, it was Mr. Troy Sunderland. And I look at Coach, and I tell him, Coach, I would love to be a part of the Penn State wrestling team. Coach has a big smile on his face. He says, sure, Ro, great. He says to me, all right, Ro, how about you become one of our managers? How about you help us take stats for the matches? Maybe you could help us videotape the matches. Be one of our helpers. Be one of our managers, he said. I look at Coach, and I tell him, no, Coach. I tell him, Coach, I want to wrestle. I want to be on the Penn State wrestling team. He looks at me and says, well, if you, if you don't have legs, and if you're in a wheelchair, how exactly could you wrestle? I told them, it's hard to explain, but I can show you. <laughs> Coach said, all right. So I took him down right in his office. <laughs> Coach looks at me and says, all right, that's enough, that's enough. And he gives me a tryout for the Penn State wrestling team. And one of our very first practices of the year was going to be something a little bit different. It was going to be a preseason condition workout in late August, where all the wrestlers on the team were going, to, were going to run up a very tall, steep hill. It was a ski slope right outside of Penn, Penn State's campus called Mount Tussie. You guys ever heard of it? I remember going to this practice, looking at all my new teammates around me, watching getting warmed up, stretching out, getting ready to run up this tall hill on their feet. And I said to myself, if I'm going to make the Penn State wrestling team, and if I'm going to be successful in non-collegiate wrestling, but in life as well, I could never, ever use this as an excuse. I could never tell someone, I can't do this workout because I don't have legs. I could never tell someone, I can't somebody after high school go to college and graduate because I'm disabled. No. No. My life motto, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's called no excuses. No excuses. You want something in life? Go get it. Go earn it. Go achieve it. So after all my teammates started to run up the hill on their feet, I followed them on my hands. Through the dirt, through the grass, through the gravel. It took me about an hour and a half to get up top of that hill. About an hour and a half to make it up Tussie Mountain. But I did it. And I finished it. Why? No excuses. And I once heard Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. say, wherever you're going in life, you should fly there. Get there as fast as possible. And don't ever let anything stop you. And if you can't fly in life, you're going to have to run. And if you can't run, you're going to have to walk. And even if you can't do that, like myself, you got to somehow, starts with a C, crawl. Really quick to wrap it up, at the beginning, I told all of you something. I told all of you by being born disabled, not having legs, that I was dealt a bad hand in life. And I'm fine with that now. I really truly am. Because to me, just because you're dealt a bad hand in life doesn't mean you gotta fold. Doesn't mean you gotta give up. You gotta persevere. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta just keep on going in life. You gotta be persistent. I'm really true believer in that every single person eventually has to overcome something in life. We all have to overcome something in life, some type of hardship, some type of struggle, or some type of adversity in life. And adversity, especially for young people, could come in many different shapes and forms. It could be growing up in a single parent household, maybe watching their parents go through a divorce, maybe watching their family struggle financially, or maybe even something pretty unique 
an extreme, like not having legs, like myself. But if I could overcome this, and if I could be successful, why can't anyone else? What's stopping you? What's holding you back? At the end of the day, hmm, what's going to be your excuse? And what a lot of young people don't realize is that for the most part, for the most part, those struggles, those hardships, that adversity, it's not always going to be there in life. Eventually, there's going to come a day when it's behind you. Eventually, there's going to come a day when it's in your rearview mirror. But as you all know in life, there are some things you can't run from. As you all know, there are some things in life that you cannot escape. I promise each and every one of you, I'll never just have one simple day in my life. I'll never just have one simple day in my life. Every single day for me is hard. Every single day for me is tough. Every single day for me is a struggle. There are a lot of things that I can't do or have trouble doing that all of you probably take for granted. And I don't mean the simple things like being able to play a certain sport, being able to go for a walk on the beach during the summer, or simply just be able to just go to the mall just once and not have every single person stare at you. Nah, I mean those things. <laughs> I mean the simple things. For the past half hour, I've given you guys some motivation and inspiration, hopefully. Give me two more minutes. Let me give you guys something called perspective. When all of you go to the grocery store, pretty simple, right? Pretty simple. When you get to the grocery store, you grab one of those big carts, you push it through the aisles, get your favorite items off the shelves, throw it in the cart, check out, pay and leave. Simple. Well, for me, it's not that easy. It's not that simple. Because physically, I can't just push that cart by myself. So what I have to do is, I have to get one of those little hand baskets. You guys ever see those there? And as you all know, those baskets, they're pretty small, right? They don't really hold a whole lot. So when I go to the grocery store, I'll get a hand basket anyhow. I'll get a couple items, wherever it can fit inside the basket. I'll check out, pay, bring that stuff outside to my vehicle, go back inside the store, check out, pay, go back inside, get some more items, check out, pay, bring out to my vehicle, over and over and over until I'm done. So when I go to the grocery store, I don't make one trip like all of you. I make three or four trips. So next time you guys are having a bad day, at home, at work, wherever it may be, and you feel like giving up, you feel like complaining about something, think about me. Think about what I'm going through in life. And think about the process that I have to go through on a daily basis to live life independently every single day without legs. And remember how despite of all this, I still succeeded. Because once in life, once again in life, there are truly no. Thank you guys, appreciate it, all right? <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, I have a video that I want to play, but before the video, I want to take a couple questions. Now, people always ask me, what's the biggest difference between speaking to kids and adults? Um, kids have no filter. They'll ask me anything, as you all know. Now, one of the things that kids always ask me is, since I don't have legs, since I don't have legs, am I really able to be independent? Am I really able to live life my own without legs? Yes, I'm very independent. And I tell them, believe it or not, I can even drive a car. How do I drive? I use hand controls. So I explain to them that in my vehicle, to the left of the steering wheel, that there's a lever that I'll pull towards me for gas, push away for brake, and on the steering wheel itself, there's an object I use to stare with one hand. So when I drive, it looks as if I'm playing a video game. And I tell them sometimes when I'm driving with my friends and we want to have some fun, if I get to a red light and there's someone to the left of me, I'll make eye-to-eye -eye contact with that person and I'll turn around my seat like this. <laughs> yeah. You should see their faces, I'm telling you, it's great. Yeah, yeah. So anything from you guys? First of all, thank you so much for sharing. It, it was an inspiration because um, we came with our daughter and there's times where she tells me, Mom, I can, stop, I can. So it was nice to hear from an adult. But what I wanted to ask you, you is, what is your degree in? I graduated with a degree in kinesiology, how to body creates locomotion. Every uh, phys ed teacher has that degree. So once again, as I stated before, my phys ed teacher changed my life. So he kind of inspired me to become a teacher myself. But instead of being a teacher, I am now a motivational speaker at schools. So yeah, it's funny how things work out. <laughs> yeah, the kids always ask me, well, how does having a degree in kinesiology help you for motivational speaking? Usually I'll just tell them that 
it helps me get my foot in the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kids never get that joke, by the way. <laughs> you have a question here? Hi, um, I'm just inspired by you. Um, thank you so much for coming out here. I have a question. You displayed how much determination you have, and I'm so determined to push my students, even my own son, who has autism, to be great, to be better than me. What if they don't have that within them? I mean, there comes to a certain point where I get frustrated for them and for my son because I see what they're capable of doing so much more than what they're putting out. How could we, or how could I inspire them more to believe in themselves? Well, I think you have to help them find their purpose in life. When I think about, about that eighth grade phys ed teacher, a lot of people just say, well, he helped me find a sport that I can play. To me, it was more than that. To me, he didn't just give me a sport, he gave me a purpose in life. And through that purpose in life, I built up a passion through the sport of wrestling. I loved the sport, had a passion for it. And through that passion, I started to have pride in myself for the first time. For the first time in my life, I was proud of myself about who I was, being able to go out there, compete against kids with legs, be able to beat those kids, pin those kids, get my hand raised at the end of a wrestling match. For the first time in my life, I had pride in myself. And I think through all of that, it gave me a different perspective in life. And it's why I'm able to go out now and share my story because I have a different perspective in life. So I think every young person has to go through that process of life. Purpose, passion, pride, perspective. That's why I call it four piece of life. And that purpose could be anything. Once again, it could be a favorite subject in school, favorite sport, art, dance, music, it could be anything. Just help them find their purpose in life. Um, I just want to say that um, what year have you been doing this? How long have I been motivational speaking? And, and um, what, what did you go to Penn State for? Uh, once again, I went to Penn State to become a phys ed teacher, but now I'm a motivational speaker. And I've been doing this now for about 10 years, close to 10 years. Yeah, my, my ultimate goal for speaking is to speak at a school in every state. Right now I've been to 42 different states. So I'm trying to get to all 50. I have a question. What if your son wants to quit a sport that he's been playing since he was five years old? He's in 10th grade in the fall. What, I, I was told not to push him, but I think it's a mistake for him to quit. I think a college would see that on his transcripts, you know, that he played soccer for all four years in high school and now he just wants to give it up. What would you tell a student that wants to just quit a sport? See, that's tough. I mean, I know a lot of kids now want to be individualized in sports, so maybe they'll quit playing soccer and baseball for one sport like wrestling or basketball, but I think he has to be involved with something. He has to do something after school, so I would really try to push him to continue and pursue his soccer career if he doesn't want to play any other sports. And also maybe he has something else that he wants to do outside of sports at home. But definitely stay, stay involved with something, definitely. Uh, okay, so this is like a lighthearted question. Right. Um, have you ever wrestled Ed Ruth? Have I ever wrestled Ed Ruth? No, he's a little bit younger than me and also a lot heavier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I would love to though. I know he's a great wrestler here at Penn State. We have another one over here as well. What were the reactions to the other wrestlers when you came out if they didn't know who you were? Did anyone ever refuse to wrestle with you? Um, I had a wide variety of reactions back in the day when I wrestled. Uh -huh. A lot of people were just surprised, amazed. I would, I would go out there and compete against kids with legs. Uh, some kids were afraid of me around my Sophomore and senior year in high school, I got a lot of forfeits. Um, people just didn't want to wrestle me. I didn't mind because it counted as a win, so <laughs> made my life easier, you know. But uh, yeah, I was just, uh, it was kind of surprising seeing everyone's reaction because everyone was a little bit different. We have another one over here. Hi, thanks for sharing your story. Um, I'm a parent of a uh, child, 14 now, who is an amputee, the result of a lawnmower accident when he was two. 
and um, we're in a live in a rural community where there are not many other individuals like him who have experienced that. And I'm curious, what is your perspective um, for someone like yourself or like him having the opportunity to interact with others who have experienced similar things? Um, he's one who feels that he's he's it's good enough to be friends with the friends he has at school. And I wonder at times if he's, is he missing out on something by not interacting with others who have experienced similar things? Yeah, definitely. The one regret I have from being younger is that since I was so different from everyone else in my school, I was pretty, uh, pretty shy. I kind of kept to myself. I had a good amount of friends as well, don't get me wrong, but uh, the one regret was that I wasn't more outgoing. And I think I let my disability hold me back in that sense. And it's funny because when I came here to Penn State, it really got me out of my shell. It really allowed me to be more outgoing and make more friends and just be more open with who I am as a person. So definitely just try to nudge him along, have him just be more outgoing in school and socially as well. How did they decide what weight you would wrestle at? Um, whatever I weighed. So in high school, I weighed about 96 pounds, so my weight class was 96. Uh, and collegiately, the lightest weight class is 125 pounds, so that was my weight class in college. I don't know, 96 pounds, pretty small. <laughs> yeah, all right. All right, uh, let me just play the video for you guys, and I'll let you go. Thank you so much again for having me. Really appreciate it. Now, this video is from ABC's 2020 a couple of years ago. Any of you kids watch 2020? That's all right, it's for old people anyway. Now that we've roused your sense of wonder, we're going to rev it up with some inspiration. It comes in the form of a young athlete who has turned his feelings of teenage inadequacy into a triumph of spirit and body. Bill Ritter has the seventh wonder of the night. This is Rohan Murphy doing his daily workout. I mean, really, how to look like this guy? Those arms, those shoulders, that chest. Exactly how strong is he? Well, talk about superpower. Rohan can bench press nearly three times his body weight. No shocker that he's a certified physical trainer at the Gold's Gym in his hometown of Islip, New York. In fact, Rohan is such a magnificent physical specimen, you can almost forget the one thing that truly sets him apart. He has no legs. Was there ever a point where you said, you know, dang, you know, why me? Yeah, definitely. I think when you're a kid, you, you just want to be just like all your friends. And unfortunately, I couldn't be like all my friends. I couldn't go out for bike rides. I couldn't play sports with them, you know? That was heartbreaking, but I just had to overcome that. What Rohan had to overcome were birth defects. No hip on one side, half a joint on the other. His legs never worked until they were amputated when he was four. For cosmetic reasons, he sometimes wore prosthetics. His fingers were also defective. They were surgically separated when he was five. Suffice it to say, Rohan was different. And it wasn't easy growing up. I, I really just didn't want to accept being disabled, you know? Whenever somebody would ask me about my disability, they would, they would come up to me and say, hey, why are you in a wheelchair? And then I would lash out at them. How, do you, how did you lash out? I would just say, it's none of your business. I just felt like I was going to explode. It was a potent combination. Teenage angst, coupled with trying to fit into a school where there were few minorities and no other disabled people. I remember those days after hearing a ninth period bell ring and all my friends were saying, I talk to you I'm going to soccer practice, I'll see you later, I'm going to football practice. And there I was with nowhere to go. And all I wanted to do was just fit in. One person would change all that. Middle school gym teacher Ron Croto saw something that even Rohan couldn't see. And so he asked Rohan to be a sports team manager, the first step in the coach's grand plan. One day before you know it, I had him doing pull-ups in class. Did like 30 or 40 pull-ups, so I always knew I was pretty strong. He said, oh, you know, I probably could do a lot more if I took my legs off. And I could see, you know, taking that weight off, he could really, you know, pull out a lot of pull-ups. In fact, Rohan did so well, he broke the school record for most pull-ups. It was then that Coach Croto talked him into becoming an athlete. A wrestler. And it was on the wrestling mat where Rohan, with half the body but twice the strength, found what had eluded him everywhere else, acceptance. To be honest with you, that was the best part, you know? The team camaraderie, it was like a second family. I just knew that 
wrestling was going to take me somewhere where I've never been before. I know it was going to give me a different life. Do you think you have an advantage? There aren't too many wrestlers without legs that you could go train with. <laughs> so I think that's definitely an advantage. You get practice, right? Exactly. <laughs> you're faster, you're more nimble. What is it? Uh, well, I think my biggest advantage was probably just my strength, you know? Because I was in such a lightweight class in high school, I wrestled 96 pounds. So you're wrestling kids who I assume most of them are not built like you are. Well, not an upper body, at least. So you have this disability, but in fact, it advantaged Rohan Murphy. Yeah, definitely, you know? And the funny thing was, the more I excelled in wrestling, the more I excelled in life, whether it was socially or academically in school. So I really felt that wrestling just took me to another level in my life. And to try to stay on that level, after Rohan graduated from high school, he went out for the wrestling team at Penn State. No one there had ever seen a legless wrestler before, certainly not the coach who had first offered him a job as a bench assistant, not as a wrestler. And then I look at him and I'm like, I want to be on a team, I want to wrestle. And he's like, how would you wrestle? So I just whip my legs off, hopped out of my chair, and I showed him some handstand push-ups, that type of thing. This is not hard for you to do? No, it's just a flare. It's kind of a breakdancing move. <laughs> so give me a move. Show, tell me the move you showed him. Well, I'm going to need you to stand up then. I'm so low to the ground and quick, I could just dive in here. Yeah. And get in a shot take my opponent down. And he said to you what? Wow, that's incredible. Well, I think I probably had to lift my lift my uh, job off the floor, but um, it was, I was just like, I was like, my mind just started twirling, like, wow, what all can we, how can we do this? And sure You were skeptical. I was skeptical, no doubt. But the skepticism quickly turned to amazement. And it wasn't just the college crowd that Rohan electrified. His just do it attitude caught the attention of Nike. In late 2008, I got contacted by somebody and they were saying that Nike's looking for an athlete for a, for a New Year's Day campaign titled No Excuses. It's written on the rainbow in letters made of gold. He quickly won them over, and what followed was a mind-blowing TV commercial. They loved it. They were just like, you know, you know their jaw just dropped. They were laughing, they were smiling, and they just thought it was amazing. Watch the donut, not the boat. As for Rowan's personal life, at 26, he is now quite independent and also quite single. It turns out, Rowan's shy. You can put me in front of uh, 500 kids and ask me to speak. That'd be easy. You can put me in front of one beautiful girl and I'd be like. <laughs> but he is anything but shy about his career. And as you can see, he has no trouble wowing an audience. Rowan has turned his personal triumphs into an inspirational message. He is now a motivational speaker. Thank you. I know I make. Doing those push-ups look easy, but unfortunately, my life hasn't been so easy, you know? I was born with a severe birth defect. What do you think resonates with people when they hear your story? A lot of people take things for granted in life, and maybe even having legs, and that's something that I don't have. And I just think it gives people a different perspective, especially kids. It really gave me a new perspective about how much hard work and dedication it really was going to take to become great at wrestling. And that's the way it is for life, for anything. Whether you want to be a state champ wrestler like I did when I was in high school, or you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, you know? I was really inspired. It's amazing what he went through. Well, he faced obstacles, but the obstacles did not stop him. He kept on going. Uh, he's got muscles, like, out to here. Like, it's awesome. You know, when you're a kid, you just want to be like everyone else. But now that I'm older and I'm wiser, you know, I know that being uh, disabled and having to deal with not having legs is a gift. And I have to use that gift to inspire and motivate others. Again. Appreciate it. All I can say is just wow, right? Wasn't that just amazing? Yeah, right? And if there's a takeaway that I can share from Something that Rohan said while he was talking with our youth that are here, he said, I was not afraid to fail. If it doesn't work out, I'll be okay. So I think if we can take that little piece or any other little piece with us from what Rohan shared with us, I think, you know, life will be much better for all of us. Just incredible.